Our topic today is forensic transcription translation. And if you're new to this, uh, in a nutshell, it means you as a court interpreter or translator are given a recording that needs to be introduced into court as evidence, but it includes speech in a language other than English or whatever your uh, courtroom language is. And so it might be a wiretap recording where two people are speaking in a foreign language. It might be an interview by a police detective of a witness or a suspect in an interrogation room. It could be a body cam or dash cam recording of an arrest or a traffic stop. And often it will include a bilingual or semi-bilingual law enforcement officer uh, speaking to somebody in another language in some mix of English and that other language. And you as the FTT specialist, the forensic transcription translation expert, um, are transcribing, first listening to it, understanding it, and then transcribing everything that you hear in one column, and then in the next column, translating that into English, and often including notes and explanations to help the jury and the judge and the lawyers and the defendant involved um, understand what it was that you heard in with your bilingual ears and brain in the original audio or video recording. And this is a sort of a hybrid of court interpreting and legal translation, and it's an emerging field that's growing in importance as more and more electronic uh, recording devices are omnipresent in all kinds of situations that end up in court. But the problem is, is that it's complex and it's often done poorly um, by people who are uh, asked to do it as part of their other job without any understanding of uh, what's involved. And so it's a, it's a growth area for continuing education and interpreter education and um, may eventually, hopefully will grow into an area that has its own certification and uh, higher standards. And in a, in a small effort to contribute to raising awareness and standards among the practitioners, I was called together a team of experts today, people who have uh, many years of experience in preparing forensic transcription translation. And I'd like to welcome Javier Castillo, who is a state and federally certified court interpreter and leads a team that has prepared thousands of uh, certified FTTs for use in federal and state court and for military and private clients. Also, Carla Collins, who is a state certified court interpreter with a master's degree in bilingual legal interpreting from the College of Charleston and has more than 10 years of experience um, preparing FTTs. She is a staff interpreter for a county. Uh, next is Chris Griffin, a federally certified uh, court interpreter since 2007, who's been doing FTTs for 18 years now um, for a county court system and as a freelancer. Also, Pilar Kalmeyer, who is an applied linguist and certified court interpreter. She was the co-author um, with uh, Dr. Roseanne Gonzalez of the FTT chapter, chapter 40 in the standard a textbook for our profession, Fundamentals of Court Interpretation, Theory, Policy, and Practice, and she has also generously provided a portion of that um, chapter uh, with some very practical guidelines, which I'll be sending out to the attendees as a PDF. Next is Judy O'Brien, who's an ATA certified translator with 25 years of experience in transcription translation, and she works for the U.S. Department of Justice's Narcotic and Dangerous Drug Section in Washington, D.C. And finally, Dr. Ray Romero of the University of Houston downtown, who has a PhD in Spanish from Georgetown University and teaches interpretation and uh, translation. He also studied analytical linguistics at Montclair State University. And each of these um, scholars and uh, professionals uh, comes from a different uh, approach, different background, and there's more than one uh, right way to do forensic transcription translation. There's more than one style guide out there. And so just to sort of uh, get a general orientation to what some of the big questions are that you'll encounter as you begin preparing FTTs, I've prepared a series of questions and sent them out in advance to the panel. And we're just gonna go through as many as we can get through in an hour and then take your questions at the end. Uh, the first one is uh, sort of a composite question. What is your process for evaluating quoting and deciding whether to accept a particular FTT assignment, and uh, are there some reasons that you would decline to work on one? And just comment on uh, sort of uh, how a job begins. And we're gonna start with Judy O'Brien. 
translation or um or have them go ahead and do the whole thing and then i'll just be the certifier at the end but so that's really the only uh, escape hatch that I have um, is to sort of punt it out to the contract and let them do it through a freelancer with specific area expertise. Okay, thank you. Javier? So just to echo what you said, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be among such great colleagues. Uh, so the process for evaluating, right, and quoting, I, I get a lot of a lot of requests. Um, so, hey, we've got this file. Can you Can you transcribe it? I don't immediately just say yes, right? That's the first thing. We Many times we find ourselves just accepting stuff. Yeah, we can do it because we've got the experience. But then you get something and the, the quality is just horrible or there's a very specific uh, program that they can't share with you that runs that particular video or the audio and because it's proprietary to the police or, or whatever. So the first thing I do is ask them to send me either the entire scope of the project or at least a couple of sample files to at least get an idea if one, if I can hear it, right? Because if I can't hear it, I can't understand it, can't transcribe it. And then um, figuring out when their deadline is. They say, oh, we've got, you know, three hours of video, we need it tomorrow. Sorry, and the answer is gonna be no. Um, we got three hours of video, we need it in two months. Fantastic, we can absolutely do that for you. So really the process is, is one looking at um, the quality of the audio, um, the number of speakers, uh, if there's background noise, if it's going to be easy-ish or extremely difficult to filter out or actually get to the the, the words, right? Um, then reaching out to my team and seeing who I have available because we don't do this ever by uh, ourselves. And depending on my availability, my team's availability, and then the deadline, that's when I decide whether I'm going to accept it or not. Yeah. Okay, and I see Chris nodding. That's that's his process as well. Bilad, how about you? This is the same thing that Javier just said. Everything comes down to the amount of time required to finish the, the job. If it is a lot of time, then I won't do it because unfortunately in Massachusetts, the agency that pays transcriber translators uh, is a fixed amount. So it doesn't pay for all of the time required to rewind and to repeat and to and to do everything also. Sometimes they overlap the quality of the room or the acoustics and, and so forth. Sometimes they give us like hundreds of phone calls. I had just a, a job. Uh, they were needing someone to uh, and transcribe and translate hundreds of phone calls from the jail. And they were, it was a mess. I said, yes, like Javier said, because you want to, to work. But right. then I said, oh, this, this is crazy. So I, I turn it down, you know? So for me, it's very easy. It's about the time required to complete the job and the turnaround time, obviously. Yeah. And, but but haven't you seen prosecutors who are hoping the case will plea out and so they're stalling because they don't want to have to invest the money in the FTT until like a week out? True. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Chris, did you have uh, something to add or were you just agreeing? No, I was agreeing and uh, I will add a little bit. I agree with uh, what Judy and Javier said. Uh, quality of the audio will play a, a big role on whether I will accept a project and the price. And then um, sometimes they are quite unrealistic with the time, the time frame that they give you to complete the project. So that will also play a role in um, what the price will be set at. But you know, I usually try to, you know, we're we're doing high quality work here. So um, some people will say yes to everything, and I mean it's your practice, so you decide what you'd like to do. But um, you know, if you want to do a good job, you don't want to. You don't want to quote something that is really unrealistic and that you won't be able to really do a good job on. And I would usually not, you know, for the most part, when I'm doing contract work, again, I'm also an employee. So some we just have to do and you just have to do it. There's nothing you can do about it. But usually would like to always hear it first before giving a quote and, and saying how long it's going to take. Yeah. Is that is that like spot check it? Here's some samples. If it's if it's 10 hours of audio, you wouldn't sit and listen to the whole thing in advance, would you? Not usually. Um, and, you know, there's usually, there could be surprises in 10 hours, and you think it was this easy project, yeah, and then all of a sudden someone comes in, or all of a sudden it gets distorted. But no, you know, because then it, 
then if you if you take all that time, then it's not worth it because sometimes you have to bid for it. You don't get it, and you spend ten hours listening to the whole thing. So, um, so usually give yourself a good idea, um, and then again, sometimes you you don't have that luxury, so you just bite the bullet, you do it, and and I agree with you know playing to the strengths of your colleagues if if you work with others, uh, using those that you know are better perhaps with a certain regional. Mm -hmm. uh, or some people are just better at hearing than others are. So if you have a team uh, like we do in our offices, someone listens, someone translates, someone's an English A, someone's a Spanish A. So we play to those strengths if you have that luxury. Yeah. Um, Carla? I pretty much agree with all of our colleagues thus far. Um, the only thing I would add is just to give an idea of the time um, to estimate rather the time is it's generally one hour of work per minute of audio recording. And that is if the audio quality is good and clear. Now, if the audio is poor, then, I mean, it can take up to three times as long. It just really depends on the quality of the audio, I would say in general, but just to give an idea of estimating the time the minimum would be an hour of work per minute of clear audio. Okay, thank you. How about you, Ray? Did you want to? Yeah, have yeah I was going to say something uh, similar that um, exactly that, you know, that it, we, in English, at least in English, it's about 800 characters per minute when we speak. So whenever you speak a minute, you need to type at least 800, that's including punctuation and everything else. It has been a very long time since the last time that I got um, a job request where they said, well, the recording, it's one hour long. We're going to pay you for only one hour. Luckily, that hasn't happened recently, which means that, you know, at least, you know, people are educated about how long it takes. But but I do have to say in the very beginning, it was like, well, you know, it's a 30 minute. We'll give you a half hour rate. I'm like, what are you talking about? So... That's important to why we refuse, even though if that is, you know, completely uh, uh, not not a good um, uh, approximation how long it takes to transcribe. Yeah. Um, Javier? I just want to add something real quick, um, uh, talking about the difficulty, right? Uh, on a recent job that I did for U.S. Attorney's Office, we did a bunch of audio. They had these videos. It must have been about 30 minutes of video. We did, my team, we did the full 30 minutes came back and there was a section where we put inaudible. Well, they had some Spanish speaking officers who were there on the scene. The first, it was a, the camera was set up in a room real high. It was during the middle of an operation. So the sound quality was horrible, but they said, we really need to hear what was said right there. We think they said this. And so we came back and listened again. So, well, our agent who was there says they heard this. And so I ended up going back and re-listening. I got, I brought in a third transcriber and we probably spent about an hour and a half trying to figure out two seconds of audio because the word that they wanted to hear was vital to the case. So yeah. we spent an hour and a half on two seconds of audio. So speaking of surprises, like uh, our colleague said a minute ago, you, you never know what you're going to, going to, find and you just have to be careful with uh, quoting your time correctly an hour and a half on two seconds of audio with three staff members so it's yeah. really like triple that in and time worked all right thank you um we're going to go on to number two and for members of the audience if you'd uh um uh, make note of your questions we'll have a question and answer period at the end and if you logged on late and didn't get the the links that's fine i'll put those up again in the chat don't worry about that uh the next question is um what are some reasons okay what are, I, I think we pretty much covered um reasons you would decline to work on a given ftt the next is uh what challenges have you had technical challenges opening and playing source files for example i've had um law enforcement agencies send me files that can only be opened by their certain video player and i can't find the video player and it's like a thousand dollar license to buy it and and have any of you dealt with other technical issues like that that formed unexpected roadblocks? Anybody? Yes? <laughs> All of the above? <laughs> okay. Um, would anybody like to comment on that or, or can we just agree? Can we stipulate to the fact that there are technical obstacles? 
Yeah, Marco, I'll jump in real quick. There are yeah. definitely technical obstacles. I find we've had it happen even with um, within, say, the Department of Justice, where we get something from the Bureau of Prisons, and technically all of our systems should be compatible uh, within the department, and it turns out they're not. And so you, I'm fortunate that I have the support of an IT department that can just go get, I think, I, I don't know what they are, codex, I don't know what these are. They yeah. go get them, they put them on my machine, and then it opens it up. But one thing that you, that I have seen when we get, excuse me, uh, uh, a DVD full of the um, the audio files from the jail. Uh, in some cases, they embed they can put on that for you an executable file that will launch the player on your system when you open them. Because they, so it could be something that you could ask for uh, that doesn't require you to purchase expensive software for this one job that you're going to work on for this particular jail or law enforcement agency. They might be able to put the player on the uh on the dvd with the files for you all right if and I that's another that. reason to to play it in advance to make sure that you can play the file before you accept the job javier so uh speaking of some challenges that uh i've had uh so i use uh software um to help me with the transcription i use um express scribe and ftw and there's one other whose name i can't remember which allow me just to control the audio with a foot pedal that start stop and most of the time i can get the audio converted if it comes in and those players uh will play mp3s wave all the different types except sometimes i get a special file that can only be opened inside that particular program from the police department and so what i've done in those cases i remember i i had to do this i opened up a program called audacity which is a which is a sound Player. Player. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. It's not just a player, but you can create audio and do a lot of stuff with it. It's for technicians. Um, and you can set the setting to record the sound on your computer. And so because I could, so then what I was able to do was play the audio inside of the officer's program and just hit play and let it play. And then it recorded in Audacity. And then from Audacity, I could take the sound file and make it into an MP3 or a wave, which then I could play inside of my Express Scribe. If not, I would have had to manually start and stop with the mouse while I'm trying to do the transcription. There's no way to go back uh, on, on that particular program. And so it, it was a workaround, but I had to play the entire audio in length. If it was a 10-hour audio, you know, I would have had 10 hours of my computer being on recording this um, device. Right. But there are definitely workarounds that you can find you just have to be creative and know what tools are out there and it helps to have an it department <laughs> yeah. um carla did you have a comment on that one sure um oops sorry about that <laughs> and working for the um, travis county district attorney's office there were times where i would get audio files that were made um from old police interview rooms and those files were only compatible uh, on their system. So I would have to ask our investigators who had access to the system to then convert it to something compatible with Express Scribe or um, I also used for the record FTR. And then another one, um, I'm assuming it's kind of similar to Audacity is called WavePad. Um, which I have used and found to be very helpful when I have a, an audio recording that is very poor, um, but you can't use a foot pedal with it. So it's more for listening and trying to distinguish what, if, if you can hear something more clearly with that program. Okay. And and you, I think you're the first person who specifically mentioned a foot pedal. If if uh, anybody in the audience wants to know more about that, there's you can buy uh, USB foot pedals on Amazon for fifty dollars, maybe that connect to a certain software that le lets you play and stop and keep your hands on the keyboard, and that, that saves a lot of time moving back and forth to your mouth. That mouse, um, it'll it'll pay for itself on the first job in terms of time saved. Um, Absolutely. Pilar or Ray or Chris, uh, any comment before we go on to the next one? Just very quickly, I tried to convert the, the video to any of the free 
uh, formatting in online, available online, or with any other one. But they use also the um, start stop is very good, the one that uh, Javier uses, and the wave uh, play, and a bunch of other ones, uh, the light. Um, and when it is not possible, then I return to the attorney. I work mostly for defense attorneys, and they have their IT people their staff, and then they would convert it for me. I asked them, okay, can you please send it to me in regular mail in a flash drive or in a CD or a DVD? And that uh, they are always interested. I have very loyal clients that they um, want to work with me only. So they would do whatever I ask. So I'm a little bit spoiled here. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Sounds good. Ray? Yeah, I had a, a similar situation with uh, a job from DEA. I was supposed to check a transcript and the transcript uh, was in a Corel file, which is something that is very old. Okay, you guys recognize it. Yeah, something that is very old. And and it wasn't an issue that uh, I guess my computer was too advanced to read those files. <laughs> and so I actually had to find a way to read them. And they also wanted it back in a Corel file. <laughs> and so I found a way uh, to do all that, but it felt like going back to the 90s or something like that. Uh, that was the only issue I encountered, but uh, not not with audio files. It was more with the the transcription itself. Okay, thank you, Javier. Just want to make a quick comment on something that uh, Pilar mentioned. Um, I would be very careful, Pilar, um, by using anything that's online, like an online converter, because um, we don't know. It, it, it's basically sending the file, which could be evidence off to a different computer. And so using these free online can be great for certain things, but I'd be very cautious to not do that with something that is, um, you know, for an FTT, because we have no idea what server that is, if they're gonna keep a copy of the recording. Sometimes they say they will, sometimes they say they won't, just like Google Translate, right? If we put stuff into Google Translate, that goes off and it can be accessible, even though they say um, it's not. So I'll just caution anyone to, use a converter that's on, you can download free converters and use them on your computer, but, but having something that you send off, um, and that may be what you mentioned, you have a free converter on your computer. I see you're nodding your head, so that's right. But there are these ones that are online, says, you know, upload the file here, we'll send you back a conversion. Just don't do that because you have no idea where that's going. No, I don't do that. I yeah. download the, the players first, and then I use them locally in yeah. the Absolutely. My husband is in IT, so he, he knows very well about these things. He <laughs> helped me. Thank you for clarifying that for other colleagues, that's for sure. Uh, Chris, did you want to jump in here before we go on? Yeah, just real quickly, just uh, um, that it can be one of the most frustrating things, because here you think you got a job, and then you got to go back and forth with your client. Hey, I can't play it. I can't play it. So just, you know, again, with... Um, with your time and everything, at the end of the day, you might have to analyze if it's worth it. Sometimes it's just, you're not able to play it. Yeah. But uh, sometimes you go back and forth and it kind of took me back to when I started doing them, there were tapes. So you you had to get that special player for the tapes. And then the, the, uh, the pedal is a must. You know, some people are able to work it out with hotkeys as well, but I love the pedal and I, it took me back to the tapes. And those, you know, those could be, you know, a nightmare as well. But just with technology, they're nice because you get to get them transferred from anywhere in the country. But sometimes it's a back and forth. And usually you do get them to play. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question has to do with uh, who works on an individual FTT. Somebody mentioned earlier different people with different strengths uh, working on the parts of the project that they uh, are best suited for based on their backgrounds. Um, but is it possible to do one entirely by yourself from beginning to end? And if so, what kind of situation would that be? Uh, Carla, do you want to jump in first? Sure, I would be happy to. Um, I always work with a proofreader. I have done what I call uncertified work. And I have a large watermark going through the transcription saying that it is uncertified, it hasn't been proofread, and it's unedited so that it will not be used as evidence in any type of proceeding. And that is generally just for someone to get an idea of what is being said. Um, but as far as certifying work goes, I absolutely always work with at least a proofreader, if not 
um, getting several other people involved, um, whether it's, you know, trying to get the transcription right or, you know, the right translation. So um, definitely a team for me. All right. Thank you. Javier? Oh, yeah, basically nothing gets done that's not in a team. Um, you don't catch your own mistakes. I mean, just as industry standard for just doing translation, right? Um, you would always make sure you've got an editor and proofreader, and even more so for audio. So always, always with the team. All right, thank you. Any other comments from the panelists? Yes, Chris. Yeah, if you don't have the luxury to have someone that's going to listen to it all, at least a proofreader to get those silly typos uh, that we all miss when we're working into late into the night and coffee just won't do anymore because we just miss them, you know? Um, so hire a proofreader and I don't wanna get ahead of myself too much, but just always expect that your work is then gonna be dissected and looked at and will be challenged. And uh, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna turn in something that will be easy pickings for them to go, this transcription is no good right off the bat. You know, make it as tough as possible. You know, sometimes we all make mistakes, but make it, you know, you know, as ironclad as possible that it'll be good to go. <laughs> yeah, visualize yourself on the witness stand defending that document, right? Oh uh, yeah, something similarly, you know, make sure there's a clear divide between the transcriptionist and the translator. Because many times as a translator, you might you may not recognize a word. Mm -hmm. and you might go back to the recording trying to make sense of the word but in reality it's it's either a coded word or a cipher word or it, it was done like that on purpose so you need to i think and, and maybe you can talk about this later but cipher language and coded language it, it's very important but um, you need to make sure that you're not going back to the recording and because after you listen to something many 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 times you start to make sense of it when there is no no meaning so that needs to be very very uh you need to be very very careful with that and um yeah something i wanted to say about the previous question is that one time i was working with a company that they just refused to send everything anything on through the internet they say this is too too uh, um too sensitive. too sensitive we cannot we cannot email it to you so I actually had to arrange meeting with them uh, at a Starbucks or a coffee shop. They would come by and give me the files and a CD, and then I'll have to go. And that's how I would do it. That that was, I mean, that means going above and beyond the Call of Duty trying to schedule meeting people and all that. So I, I didn't like want to mention that with the other question. <laughs> <laughs> you feel like a drug dealer meeting in sketchy locations to pick up the yeah. CD? <laughs> it was still Starbucks, so it wasn't sketchy, but but you have to go a little beyond to fix that yeah good and um i'm just as a follow-up to this one this isn't in our list here but do you panelists agree that somebody has to be um somebody has to sign the certification statement and that person who's who's overseeing or who's the main ftt creator needs to have heard the audio and been involved in all all stages of the process so they can vouch for it like you can't say, oh, that's somebody else's job. I wasn't involved in that. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm just certifying the translation. You also have to be, um, when you when you sign the certification, you're saying I'm familiar with the audio and I I stand by this rendering. Yeah. Pilar, did you want to say something? It yes, I think that everyone involved in the team, every participant, they have to listen to everything. They have to read everything. They have to be a partaker of everything because what we do is not just a verbatim uh, work, you know, we listen to the tape and then we write down, we type what we think that it was said. But it's not only that, it's, a, it's also the discourse, the discourse, the language and action, what we are transcribing and translating ultimately. So I may be um, transcribing something, it's not just what it is said, but how it is said. So how am I going to mark how it was said? Since the transcriptions, they are not actual mirrors of the event that occurred in the, um, in the interrogation room, for example. The, the transcripts are very far away. They are not actual mirrors of what happened. We do our best, but as transcribers and translators, we have to make sure 
that uh, we can convey everything as possible as long as it doesn't interfere with an easy reading of that document because the uh, fact finders, attorneys, and uh, even the, the LEP person, limited English proficient person will be reading it. So it has to be um, readable and at the same time, as transparent as possible. So everyone has to be in the game. Everyone has to understand. Obviously, they both have to be bilingual people. Some of these bilingual people would be with the Spanish, uh, stronger in the Spanish, native Spanish speaking. And uh, for the translation the part, which is in English, it would be someone native speaker. So yes, I, I try to give it to, I, I divide my uh, job in those two types of uh, workers. But it is very important for my team to know that uh, this is not just uh, uh, word by word and that's it. And I, Because language is not like that. Language is not in the vacuum. And uh, it has to be the discourse. How, what this man's person tried to say? What did he mean to say when he said yes? In a Miranda Rye, for example, yes, 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 yes. Well, um, did he really say yes? How do I um, mark? How do I represent that yes? Is, is, is it a, a very solid yes, a very loud yes? <laughs> or is it is a soft yes? O okay, okay. How do I represent that? So my people have to understand that. I have to, to do the tr transcript, the, the job as transparent as possible. And that is not advocacy like many other colleagues that we have had very good conversations and discussions that they say, no, that's advocating. No, it's not advocating. Advocating to me in, in many ways is when, when our colleagues, many transcribers, they do, for example, police interpreters or uh, yeah, the staff interpreters that they are police officers they are called for an interrogation to assist with an interrogation. And they have this Spanish very broken and they ask questions very, especially with the Mirandas, with a lot of um, these fluencies and uh, false hedges and, and repetitions. And uh, almost as if they wanted to confuse the, the interviewee. So the colleagues that would embellish and that would edit, um, that would make uh, the, the police officer sound much better than, than it really sounds to me as a, as a witness of the expert, as, as an expert witness of the tape. So that colleague is doing a disservice. That colleague, so my team, they have to understand the, yeah, the asymmetrical, the asymmetrical relations of power. You know, that's what discourse analysis is, how the interaction is taking place and who is at disadvantage, why this person is, so it's a lot of things that my team has to be very aware. They have to read the whole storyline. They have to get acquainted several times and then start transcribing and pour out everything that they hear and see. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Lots of good stuff there. Um, I just want to add a comment before I go into the next question. If you are a beginner to this practice and you're like, what, I have to have a whole team? It's just me. You know, my, my language is Hmong and I'm the only Hmong interpreter I know. Where am I going to put together a team of experienced Hmong transcriber translators? Just think about, uh, take baby steps, you know, look at this as the ideal best practice and figure out how you can work in this direction and try to educate your clients. If they come to you, say, look, this is a very complex process. It needs at least two people working on it so that we can um, correct each other and, and work together. And maybe every time we say this to a client, we are helping raise awareness uh, profession wide for uh, what goes into a quality FTT. Chris? I was going to say, if you don't have, if you're not going to be able to, to use a proofreader or someone to spot check certain uh, audio, um, just use a good rule of thumb that's always helped me is if it doesn't make a lot of sense, be careful to write it. You might be better served using a you because most people, unless they're crazy, they speak usually making sense, especially if most of the interview they've made sense. So all of a sudden a statement that doesn't fit, be careful with that if you don't have the luxury of using someone else. And then read it and maybe step away from it if, you, if you're able to for a yeah. few days and then come back to it, listen to it, and then check it again and read it again because you're putting your name and, and you're the one that's going to be up on that witness stand. So um, if, if you don't get to work with a team, be extra careful. Good, good rule of thumb. There's an expression in Spanish to consult with your pillow. Sometimes after you consult with your pillow and you wake up the next day, uh, the idea has has uh, worked its way through your subconscious. 
Okay, a um, couple more questions here before we go to the uh, open portion of the program. Um, which nonverbals would you note in a transcription and which would you omit from your transcription? And it, it depends a lot on the type of recording that you're working with, but if somebody coughs, chuckles, sneezes, slams a door, if cars honk in the background, if somebody's going to the bathroom while wearing a wire, you know, which sound effects do we need to see in the transcription? Who wants to start? Judy? Sure. Um, I, I think you, uh, you know, need to account for everything that you hear, obviously. Um, you would uh, just carefully with caution because um, sometimes you can run the risk of being too specific in your description of a sound, assuming that you know what you're hearing. Um, and it, it might not be exactly what you think. So I try to go for broader words instead of, you know, maybe um, like I think you noted in your list, traffic passing or traffic noises. Um, and sometimes it, there's just so much going on in the background that I might just put a bracketed background noise throughout um, if you if there are sounds that just you know aren't discernible uh, separately there's just a lot of background noise um, you know or I think before we before we opened uh, the the waiting room and let everyone in we were talking about body wires that might have uh, you know take place record conversations that take place in noisy restaurants next to the piano player and you know you're not going to be able to account for the piano player it every time you hear the piano so you make a broad statement you know piano music heard throughout recording but uh you know and you have to be careful with the word choice i think for your background sound um because it can impart unintentionally you can impart meaning to uh what someone has said if uh uh, I see you put chuckles um, and sighs. And if you use, th there's nothing wrong with those words inherently, but if you put chuckles in a certain context, you might be giving the impression that the person um, is, is speaking sarcastically or, uh, so it just account for everything, yes, but co consider the, your word choice when you're accounting for those background noises. Yeah, what, what connotation you might be implying with your right. Ray, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, uh, I, a lot of these conversations uh, take place on purposely with a lot of music in the background. Um, so, uh, it, first of all, a lot of times, look at the feedback that you're getting that you're getting with the company you're working with. A lot of times, they might want a, a, you know every single sound. A lot of times, you know, they you don't really need to be that specific. So, kind of try to follow the format, um, but. I had even companies that asked me, well, can you recognize the song that's in the background? <laughs> you know, the, they've asked me, like, can, can you, you know, by the lyrics, you know, do, do you know what song it is? And, uh, so it really does depend on your company. Okay, thank you. Javier? Um, nothing, nothing to add. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, if you hear it, add it as best you can. And everything that the that Judy and Ray said were spot on. I, I've worked on interrogations where the person is sniffling because they have a cold and I, the first 20 times they sniffled, I put in sniffle and then I realized this isn't even going for three hours. And so I, I went back and deleted all but the first one and just made it into a, a note that this person is sniffling throughout the remainder of the conversation because it didn't seem to have any communicative value. They didn't sniffle at key points in the sentences. Oh, well, then that leads me to something I can say. So yeah, absolutely. Right. If somebody is just completely speaking fine the entire time and all of a sudden they're asked a question and it's, <clears throat> i mean uh i was <clears throat> yeah i was i was at the uh <clears throat> with my mother that might be something yeah you would want to add every single time because that cough or that sneeze or that long sigh could be indicative of something so yeah. absolutely if it's something new definitely i, I would want to include that there mm, okay okay chris, chris. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, yeah, I agree with the with the putting throughout uh, noise throughout, and then also it could be specific and explain why you have a you at a certain part of the of the recording. It gets really bad, or all of a sudden the traffic gets really bad, or someone's honking their horn, and that's why you all of a sudden 
you're transcribing real clearly throughout and then you have a bunch of U's. Mm -hmm. So it kind of explains that. And I have an example of what Judy said. Uh, we got like a little too specific on our marker and we put like nervous laugh. <laughs> and then, like, no, let's just go with, you know, laughs or chuckles instead of adding nervous because then that adds maybe an element of guilt or something. We're, we're not being as neutral as we should be at that point. And it, it's adding a little more than we should. Good example, right? I wanted to add that also don't forget about silence, that silence also has meaning. So when there's more silence, you know, we realize that that has meaning, then put it, you know, even if it's buried to error in the Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Pilar, I can't tell if that's just your hand to keep you pinned or if you're raising your hand. <laughs> yes, I just was going to say um, when it is inanimated the sounds, um, then uh, if it is a door slamming or it is okay to put it just for the reader for the client to see that it was very hard and that's why we had to put it unintelligible or undiscernible and so that's important however when it comes to human sounds like Javier was saying someone is coughing a lot um I would not try the coughs maybe I, I would be very careful but if someone is crying, for example, or if someone is um, uh, shrilling, or if someone is uh, weeping, so I might I might write it down. But if, every um, tape is on a case by case uh, analysis, you know. So um, I would I would be very careful with uh, human sounds. How would I convey? How would I represent them without hurting or helping anyone? but conveying what is anyone else could see, what, what I see, and that if I ask a colleague or another person, what do you see there that if we matching our assessment and our perception, then I would put it there, the most objective uh, possible. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, what do you guys think about uh, emphasizing words? And, and the example that came to mind was if somebody says, I didn't kill him, versus if they say, I didn't kill him or I didn't kill him. That makes a big difference in the meaning. How would you indicate that in your transcription translation? Javier, you'd ignore it? <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, I would I would not um, do anything like bold underline, just keep it j just like the court transcript, right? If you just think what we're trying to produce is the same thing that a court reporter would produce of a deposition or a trial, they're not uh, adding notes, they're not uh, underlining, they're not uh, bolding, putting stuff in italics, not at all, because we may hear something completely different. And, you know, so definitely there, at least I've, I've never seen and I've never added, and I don't think I ever will add anything that would in indicate there's particular stress on this word more than another. You wouldn't put it in all caps if they're yelling, anything like that. All right. Yeah. Chris, what do you think? I agree with Javier. Um, I've never done it, and I don't think I would. The only, um, because then it would not be an objective or an impartial transcript. The only uh, scenario that I would say is if you're working for a specific side of, or a specific party, and they're, they've asked you for look, to look for these things, but usually I've not done it in writing. I give them a report and I say, by the way, he confessed to killing him at minute 45. Um, you know, or I would say he was very adamant that he had done it in his yes or in his denial at this point, but I don't think I would do it on an impartial transcript. If you do that, then you're turning it into, into something where it's, again, you're now going more for either the prosecution or for the defense. Uh, the caps, I didn't mind too much. You added at the end, you know, for you're like, stop yelling at me when you write an email all caps. So maybe, but I've never done it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, who else on the panel has a comment? Pilar? Yes, I wouldn't uh, mark in, in any way either because the statement in itself is uh, pretty clear and convincing. So uh, adding a word in what syllable or what word the, the emphasis is, uh, it wouldn't help. So I, I would leave it like that. that. That's kind of something that I just would leave it like that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Um, yeah, Marco, I just wanted to say too, just to keep in mind the, the, what is going to happen with the transcript uh, when this goes, this 
recording and the transcription and translation is in court in trial, that recording is going to be played, first of all, um, and the transcript is going to be a guide. Now, if it's a foreign language, it's probably going to be entered into evidence as well, and the jury will have access to it when they deliberate. But keeping in mind that the recording is going to be played, and so like in the example that you gave in your questions, you know, if he's saying, I didn't kill him, or I didn't kill him, you know, granted the jury may not understand the, the recording as it's being played, but that is not our responsibility at that point. That is the responsibility of the defense attorney or the prosecutor to bring that through in the questioning of the witness who is there, uh, th th that they're bringing this recording in through. So if it's a co-defendant or a cooperator or a witness or an agent, that part of what you noted in that question is really between the attorney and the witness who's bringing the recording in to address that. Okay. Any uh, any dissenting views here before we go on? Bilal? I just want to um, to say the difference because what Judy is talking about, I think that the tape that is uh, uh, played in uh, in English, so in Transcriptions in English, that's one thing because the people get to get the best evidence, which is the recording itself. However, with the uh, bilingual uh, uh, transcripts and the jury or the fine factors, they don't get to, to see, to watch or to listen to the, to the tape. Only the judge in motions to suppress, the judge might see and they might see the intention, the body language of the, of the suspect or so forth, but um, it is, the best evidence in English, when it is in English, then the fact finders have the benefit to watch the tape and to decide whether the person said, I killed him or I killed, I didn't kill him, I didn't kill him. So to see those, that nuance. So I, I don't know if Judy works also with the bilingual uh, interro interrogations or bilingual tapes. I, I guess so, because I, I have been working a lot with people from in Europe, in Australia, pre precisely in England and Wales, that they work a lot in uh, with the transcriptions, no translation of uh, English uh, interrogations. And there is a lot of material, a lot of literature and a lot of uh, journals, very interesting. I have learned a lot fr from them, but that's only when it is in English. So I always try to, to uh, set a parallel with wh what I do with two languages. So huh. that's why it's interesting to know what is going to be uh, best evidence and what is going to be. Uh, that's why we interpreters are, are doing this type of work is a great responsibility that we have because um, it, what we do most of the time doesn't go, it doesn't get reviewed because it's two languages. So people don't want to, to get the vagaries of the complications of dealing with, with a tape that is in two languages and then the transcription is in two languages. So it, uh, most of the times they never go for a, for a review or for be, to be checked or anything. So whatever we do, that's it. And whatever it is in the transcript, whatever is right there, that's the, the, the best evidence. So it's just interesting to know that this is very important, whether we are working, I mean, we, most of us, I assume in here in this uh, uh, webinar is people that work with two languages, I, I assume. Mm -hmm. And Mark, if I can just respond to that, I'm also working in, in two languages, and this may be a detail that varies by judicial district. Um, in our district, absolutely, the video is played. We can't just submit a transcript of a recording of any kind without the accompanying recording. So even if the jury is not understanding what's being spoken on the tape, that, that recording is being played in court. The video is being played in court. Uh, and in fact, we've had to, uh, you know, litigate whether or not um, the transcript is considered evidence, because if it were in a single language recording in English, um, and the jury speaking, so the recording goes, we, you might prepare a transcript for that, and that's considered an aid for the jury, but they don't get to take that with them when they deliberate, if it's just an English recording. Um, but when we get to the foreign language recordings, at least in our district, the recording is played for the jury um, and the transcript is also entered into evidence. So they do get to see, they get the benefit of seeing the body language of any video recordings um, and in any audio, like I said. So um, in this case, the transcript is still an aid, but it's one that the jury must rely on because otherwise the, the audio or video is inaccessible to them. Um, but it's still um, something that the, uh, those sorts of that kind of emphasis or 
uh, slang, uh, coded language somebody brought up previously, you know, I, one that's off the top of my head, you know, in, in uh, drug slang, they have uh, coded words for different cities. Um, and it's not up to me to put the name of the city in my translation. I know what they're talking about. If they're talking about, pick one, you know, el Los Vientos or Las Torres. Okay, Las Torres, what used to be New York. Um, but if they say Las Torres, I can't put New York. Same with those kinds of, that sort of emphasis that Marco is bringing up, you know, it's, it's not, I don't feel it's for me to put that in the transcript. Um, the jury will hear the recording, the court will hear the recording, and that's for um, the attorney on whichever side mm -hmm. to bring up with the witness and discuss it with the witness, because the transcript should just be there as a, a reflection of what you hear and that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> can I say just something? Oh, of that's, course. That's very interesting. Uh, I, I'm I'm learning this. This is very good, Judy. Thank you for sharing, because I have um, read so many arguments, very strong arguments against playing the tape for the jury in a jury uh, a bilingual tape, because as we all know, communication, especially nonverbal communication, is not universal. So uh, a Chinese person might be doing something or be silent. So all of those things can be misinterpreted and misperceived by the jury. So I, that's why I know that legal appeals and everything that uh, against playing a foreign or a two languages a tape in a jury for fact finders. So this is new, I'm going to, I'm going to look into it because it's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, last question that we'll have time to cover as a group here today um, is what do we do with the police officers and other law enforcement employees who we hear on the recording who are trying to speak the non-English language and uh, ha with varying degrees of success, how do we handle that in the forensic transcription <laughs> translation? Um, who wants to start? There's lots we could say on this topic. Chris? Are you ready to use some sick? <laughs> we sick them. <laughs> so we use, we use a lot of sick uh, that, to reflect their mistakes, their grammar mistake, mistakes on the left-hand side. Of, I mean, I think there's different, different systems, but I use a left-hand side column. And then on the translation side, then you have a key. A lot of people use a key. And then you do grammar, gender, uh, uh, different, I mean, different. What the error is. What was that? To describe what kind of error it was. The errors, yeah. I, I know a lot of people just use grammar, but some get very specific with gender, non-number agreement, you know, all kinds of things. So, um, uh, or usage. Sometimes the usage is right, you know, the cognates that they love to use, you know, for example, in Spanish, we have uh, the, the one with uh, child abuse, usually, 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 uh, usually the molest is an issue, you know molesting and the word molestar in Spanish. So um, sometimes a footnote, I don't, I think that will come later, but you know, sometimes you have to put usage and then use a footnote. And if it's an actual mistake, uh, sick it. And then sometimes you have people that have lived in the U S for a long time and they won't bat an eye and they'll continue talking and use, giving it that meaning. So that's kind of an interesting scenario as well, where, where they actually do understand the term being used that way. So then it puts you in another, another conundrum there <laughs> um what do you think carla i agree with chris and use the same sort of system uh well actually the same system uh <laughs> where we um seek on the transcription side and then on the translation side uh mark the kind of error usually just gram uh, for grammar um usg for usage and um I think that's basically it as far or pronunciation can be another one but if it is um a not standard usage but it is um understood in a region um i always check with uh for example there's the dictionary um of mexicanismos um, or mexican sorry dictionary of mexican spanish that I use DEM, um, and you can find that online. And, you know, things like troca that some people may say is a calc. Well, it's actually 
um, uh, in that Mexican dictionary. So if it's understood, and these are two speakers that understand this term, then I'm not going to mark it. Okay, thank you. Um, Ray, did you have a comment on law enforcement Spanish? Uh, no, it's just I agree with everyone else has said, except that it, that can be part of uh, the evidence. Because if the detainee didn't understand how he was being approached or he was being talked to, then that should be marked as well. <clears throat> I wanted to say also that there are a lot of resources out there as far as dialects of Spanish and even coder and cipher language. I'm going to put two links on the chat. If you guys are interested, you can take a look. Um, but yeah, like I agree with whatever else I said about that it needs to be transcribed and definitely I also use SIC, as I see. Can you, uh, just a second, Javier, right? Can you define coded and cipher language for everyone? Yeah, it's uh, any kind of al alteration or modification of a language uh, in order to prevent a direct understanding of what's being said. Uh, there are many different mechanisms like moving the syllables around or like uh, Judy mentioned, you know, Los Aires or Las Torres, things like that, to refer to cities, places, drugs, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so I actually gave a talk about that in Taji. You can find it if you Google that. Um, but uh, it, it's also very important. I also agree with what uh, Judy said, that you, you might be tempted to try to decipher the language yourself, but that's not your job. You're the transcriber. Um, maybe include a note if you if you have a feeling of what it might be, but do not make it part of that transcript. Okay. Thanks. And I'll put, I'll, I'll put a couple links. Um, the ADL is very good in documenting hate speech and hate symbols. Mm. So I'm going to put one of their links. And I'm also going to put a link for a, an online dictionary of varieties of Spanish that is really good because it tells you it identifies the country and the region where, where, it's, where it comes from. Because what can be um, non-standard in one variety can be like the only word they know in another variety yeah. and vice versa. All right, thank you. Javier. I just wanted to go back to the law enforcement and being careful when we're putting in. So I don't, I don't go in um, for grammar uh, unless, it, let me answer this. So it depends what my work is, right? If I'm being hired just to do forensic transcription translation, then I'm not going to do anything that was going to pass judgment. I have been hired as an expert on language that because they allege that uh, maybe the, the translation was bad in a Miranda warning or in a form, or that maybe somebody, the Spanish that the officer spoke wasn't correct. I was hired as an expert for that purpose, which is very different from just doing the transcript, uh, just doing the transcription translation, right? Coming, if you're just doing the transcription translation of audio, your my expertise is limited to the creation of the transcript from the audio, and that's it. And I don't get into well, I think that the off the the officer misspoke, and therefore the understanding wasn't clear. That's not my role at that time. That would be for a different type of expert. It could be me as well, or somebody else. But uh, you need you need you need to be very careful about understanding what your particular role is when you're asked to do the transcription translation. If you're if you're hired to do transcription translation, um, we need to be very careful so that we're not uh, adding things. Oh, this was unintelligible or un, uh, the it was obvious that the Spanish speaker wasn't able to understand this because the officer used bad grammar, right? That would be very different from me being hired as an expert because, hey, we think that the officer and the um, client didn't understand each other. So can you transcribe this and give us your professional opinion, expert opinion on the use of language? So two very different roles. And so we need to make sure that we're um, no roles at that time for that particular job. Okay, thank you. Any other panelists comments on the topic of handling law enforcement errors in your transcription, Pilar? Yes, and that's why for me, this is very important, the approach and the, the profession. I think that the, to me, it's very personal point of view, it's time to, to start seeing transcription translation as a post-monolingual, um, uh, uh, work, you know, um, so we cannot um, we cannot say okay, whatever I hear, and I, I just hear that, and I'm going to put that. 
even though it's true, we cannot tell if the person understood or didn't understand because we are not them and we are not in their mind. However, there are some language evidence that clearly would point to, to the fact that the person very likely will not understand. Therefore, I, when I um, do my transcriptions, I do feel with the license, I feel that uh, we should all, all should aim for the expertise that is required to defend whatever you write in there. And I'm not going to say he didn't understand, the, the suspect didn't understand, but I'm going to write down like very fast reading, very fast uh, delivery of the Miranda rights, for example. Um, I put in, in some little marks that the Dr. Gonzalez and I came out with a very good um, key uh, legend that yeah. we would share with everyone else. So it, it is very compressed, you know, that is very fast. And so many other uh, like um, these fluencies, many differences. And then at some point, in many times I, I do say uh, ambiguous, very ambiguous delivery. I, I'm gonna say it because if they call me to, to the stand to say why is ambiguous, then I will explain why. And I think that that's why we should all aim towards that, uh, that direction that we are interpreting and uh, transcribing translation is the two different uh, fields. It's two different skill set. It requires. It is very different. So we are not going to do to to mirror it or with the interpreting. So there there are canons. That, there are uh, standards. Yes, there, there are you know things that uh, that we we have to abide to rules. But at the same time, this is a, we are authors. Like uh, Javier said, we are authors of these papers, you know, of these texts that they are gonna come and they are going to be part of the package that will, of the evidence, the discovery that will determine if someone goes to jail forever or for the, to the death penalty, or if someone is, 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 is going to be exonerated or free will, you know? So we have to be um, very, very clear with uh, what we have. So if someone is going to go to, to jail because of they are guilty of a crime or so forth, um, it, it, that's one thing, but language shouldn't be a contributor to um, to someone, uh, to a guilty person to be, um, you know, uh, sent to jail or, or to someone to be set free. So it's important to um, to express and to represent, I, I'm seeing someone in here is being a little distracting. Um, so it is important to mark all of the, the, the problems that the police uh, had to deliver that uh, those Miranda rights, I, I especially I always pay much attention, particular attention to the first, to the Miranda rights, because after that, the person says, yes, yes, did you understand? Yes, yes, yes. And you know that I wouldn't have understood. A, a friend of mine or a person from my country coming in hearing those, the delivery of that, those Miranda rights, wouldn't have understood. And the person is saying, yes, yes. So it's good to problematize it and, and maybe not for the, I mean, attorneys will appreciate that a lot, you know, and I'm saying I'm a little bit not biased, but a little bit uh, have much more experience working in noticing those, uh, those problems with the police delivering the Mirandas. Uh, I have plenty of uh, cases that I have done, like they call them Mirandas or Miranda, or they do it on purpose. And then you hear the police officer speaking a very good Spanish in other sections of the of the tape, however, for the Mirandas, they deliver them very poorly because that sometimes that that's the purpose. It's just to to elicit a confession from from the defendant. To huh. elicit a confession, absolutely, and that's very well documented in the literature, in forensic linguistics, and social linguistics, and all of the fields. And people should start reading more about these things so that we can do a good job for the good of everyone. Otherwise, we are perpetuating the institutional systems of a. Uh, you know, of differences in the um, xenophobia and racism and you call it. And I don't want to sound too political, but that's the truth. I mean, we, 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 are, we have a very a lot of responsibility doing this type of work uh, adequately, properly and transparently. Thank you. Um, Chris. Just to clarify, I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna pass judgment on the, uh, on the officer, but I think the question talked about when they, there's definitely language issues there. I'm also not going to clean it up. I'm not going to make them sound like this Oxford professor in Spanish or you know, vice versa. I'm not going to do that because then it's not an accurate reflection of yeah. the language that they were talking. So, but if I hear mistakes where I know, you know, he's in a certain city and he talks about a certain port of entry, and I know that's not the name, I'm going to let it stand because, yeah. because it's um 
the, the transcript many times will, will speak. Yeah. Right here. Go ahead. Uh, you know, it will it will speak for itself. And I'm also not going to also indicate whether I thought the defendant was understanding or not either. You know, again, that will speak for itself. And it will, it will, it will show throughout the transcription, kind of as Pilar said, there will be moments of brightness, maybe that officer. And it's so interesting. Sometimes you have this officer that's so limited and you've sicked them and you've done all these grammar mistakes and the guy's falling right along and he, and he goes on to confess and he gets his guy even though he was so limited, but I'm also not going to clean him up and make him sound like he was speaking in proper, proper Spanish the entire time. Okay, thank you. I'm putting a, a link here in the chat again. For those of you who came in late and need a certificate of attendance, you can click on that little form and fill it out. And there's also a, a link to Javier Castillo's, let's call it follow on training for FTTs. Javier, can you give us a little summary of what you'll be teaching? Uh, sure. Uh, next, sat two Saturdays from now, 17th, I'm going to have a one hour intro class, which is going to talk uh, about how to set up FTTs, the types of equipment that you need, the um, software that you need, the, how you think about it, how to set up your team, go step by step through the processes, and then include a lot of the uh, links of the links to the uh, documents that you're going to share, uh, Marco, um, like the Nagit uh, position paper and things of that nature. And then after that, I'm going to actually have a three hour workshop where we will actually download the software, work with it, and actually work on transcribing and translating, uh, or rather just transcribing. It's going to be language neutral, so it'll just be English to English, um, but it'll give the participants a chance to actually put into practice some of this stuff. So thank you for that. All right. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, and I'm now putting in the chat the section from uh, Fundamentals of Court Interpretation, what I call the Bible of Court Interpreting, a very uh, comprehensive volume. And Pilar Kalmeyer uh, co-authored the chapter on FTT, and she has generously uh, provided uh, the section in that which uh, goes through the process for creating an FTT in some detail um, with lots of uh, good uh, guidance that will apply to all of you working in whatever languages. So I encourage you to download that and study that. I'll also be sending it out next week with my follow-up email in case you're having trouble getting links out of the chat or something. Um, this concludes the uh, the panel questions, but I'd like to um, first of all thank all the panelists uh, for appearing here for taking their time, not just today, but in preparation for this. And so a round of applause. And then I'd like to invite any of the um, attendees who have questions to put in the chat and I will read those out um, and invite the panelists to comment on those. I know there have been some questions up above that have already scrolled so far. I, I can look for them, but if you could type your question in again, that'll make it easier for us to focus on it. I have a question. This is Norma Mann. Yes, Norma. Uh, the, uh, there are occasions when we are called to testify regarding our transcription and translation. Um, generally, we try to avoid that, but uh, occasionally we are we are asked to uh, test, you know, testify as to uh, the uh, accuracy of what we translated or transcribed. Uh, that, as I understand, is not a role that we should take. Uh, there are also times when all they want to be sure is that we are qualified to have done it. So that's okay. I, I have no problem with that. But as to the transcription and translation verification, uh, how do you feel about the interpreter or rather the translator uh, testifying? Taking the stand as a, to defend the, the FTT? Correct. Uh, Javier? So it's just like any other expert, you know, the, the drugs get sent to the SBI or the FBI lab. They produce a report saying, hey, we analyze this and there's 42.6 grams of a mixture of substance that contains meth. They can't just allow the report in unless the parties stipulate. So they will have to bring in the SBI chemist or the FBI chemist, fingerprint expert as well. And all they're testifying to is, I, I, I analyze this and I produce the report. That's really the limits of your testimony as the expert witness for the production of the transcription translation. 
I am, I am the person who did this transcription translation. These are my credentials. And then they'll ask you about, uh, you know, they'll ask you your foundation, like what makes you qualified? Why do you think you can do this? Right. Usually the person, the, 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 the party that hires you will set that up in the direct. And then of course you're set to, you then you have to listen to the cross examination and deal with that. Then then that's uh, the other side will try to poke holes both in your um, expertise or lack thereof. If you're somebody who is hired to do this and you shouldn't be doing it, which happens quite a bit, um, or if they you know that party has hired somebody else and they have issues with your word choice or your translation choice, and then you just say, hey, I did the best that I could with the knowledge that I had. That's it. So uh, there's nothing wrong with um, that is actually part of part of the process is if you produce something that is going to be used as evidence, you're going to have to get up there and testify unless the party stipulate that they, they're not going to not going to call you and they'll just let the transcription stand. That's been my experience, at least. Thank you. Pilar. Thank you. Javi. Yes, yes, Norma. Um, your question is very good. Um, we have to make sure that we understand the different roles. A transcriber translator is not an interpreter. So I know I've been an interpreter for 25 years that one of the things that we fear the most and hate the most is if we are called as witnesses about our interpretation. This is not that way. So you shouldn't be um, feeling that you are uh, uh, failing your rules of an interpreter if you go and you are called as an expert in what you just did. I'm sure that when you were doing your transcription translation, you were certain 100% of what you were writing down, transcribing and translating. So therefore, there is nothing, there is no breaking any rules or there is no unloyalty or anything with you going in to talk about what you just did. It's very, I think this is, is very good and it's very, um, empowering to to go and to to defend your your own what, what you saw as long as it is a good uh, transcription translation and that's why I'm saying that being as transparent as objective as possible is is, is the best but but you have to separate the two the two lines of working the, the two approaches the, the two professions you have to otherwise you 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 will feel always constrained to to not do the the real uh, transparent and reflexive um you won't have a reflexive practice as an uh, as a transcriber translator you do your work as an interpreter that's one thing and as a transcriber translator is another you have much more latitude and at the same time you have much more responsibility and you have to feel comfortable with going and and defending every word that you put in your transcription translation. Thank you. Hey, Marco, if I could jump in just real yeah. quick with a point. That's everything Pilar said is spot on. And that's a great, uh, great to point out that there, th these are two separate roles. And if you are called to testify on your work product, your transcription and translation, this is nine times out of 10 or nine and a half times out of 10, a legal strategy by one party or the other, and not necessarily an effort to impugn your work product or point out errors. It's simply a legal strategy. There will be defense attorneys that will not stipulate to anything. It's just their legal strategy. They're not going to yield any ground. They're going to say, you know, I'm just going to argue everything. And Javier made a point too about, you know, um, uh, stipulating or not or saying if if you're on the stand and they're going to get down in the weeds with you and argue about a word choice that you made um, you do have a little bit of agency there as well because they should have presented a competing version of a transcript if they had they should not be arguing with you live in trial on the stand about a word choice that is something that the court should have pushed that uh, you know that opposing counsel to make that point in a competing transcript or a competing expert, but they shouldn't be rehashing your word choice with you on the stand. It's primarily, a, a, and it's an opportunity. If you, if you wanna look at it a little differently, you can look at testifying as an opportunity for you to have your credentials validated before the court. You've now been qualified as an expert you know, by the court. Uh, and it's an opportunity for you to tout your expertise, your background, your preparation. And like Javier said, you know, I, I, this is me, this is my, you know, resume and here's the work product that I've given to you. And so you can rely on it. Um, but it's, 
more often than not just a legal strategy, not um, a commentary on your abilities or your work product. A absolutely. That's what I have found that usually the reason they're calling is they're just verifying your, your qualifications and uh, presenting to the court that we have presented this, this evidence that has been developed by a qualified translator, transcriber, translator. So that's fine. But occasionally they start quibbling with the words, like you say, and uh, I, I, it hasn't happened to me but I've heard other interpreters have had that problem. So I, your explanation and everybody else's helps a great deal to guide these people as to how to handle it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, for further questions and follow-up, we do have a Facebook group and a WhatsApp group um, dedicated to discussion of these questions amongst uh, people who prepare FTTs. The links for those were in the email that I sent to everybody yesterday. If you didn't get the email yesterday, it's probably in your spam. About half of the emails I send out end up in people's spam. So please check there. And if it's not there either, uh, email me and I will uh, send you a copy. Um, but this is all the time we have today. I've got somewhere I need to be soon. I know you all have busy weekends planned, but uh, again, my, my heartfelt appreciation to everybody who showed up, especially our six panelists. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nancy. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays, Thank everybody. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you